All right. So don't worry, that is from earlier this week. So let's talk about graphing, okay? This is a visual display of data that makes trends easier to see than they are in a table, much like I was mentioning beginning of this. So some of the main types of graphs that we are going to utilize in class, obviously there's, there's, there's plenty more, but these are some of the more important ones in terms of science. Circle graph, or we also call them pie charts, bar graph, and line graphs. The three main ones, um, and you can you can alter these types to um, you know show different types of data to make it to your your own. Okay, again, these types of graphs shouldn't be new to you. Okay, I even remember back in junior high, middle school, using graphs. Okay. And that was, oh, let's just say that was before the internet. So there you go. Um, but again, types of graphs will be determined by each individual with the notion that um, each type of graph has intended uses, meaning the type of data to present, it, you know, it does kind of lean towards specific graphs, okay? So let's talk with uh, start. Sorry, with circle graphs. It uses wedges to visually represent percentages of a fixed whole. So obviously, um, looks like what I'm going to have for dinner tomorrow night, and I'm excited. Pizza. Okay. So each slice of pizza represents a percentage of that pizza. Now my goal is to eat the 100% of that pizza. My wife is out of town, so she can't stop me. So. I'm going to eat that pizza. Again, it's also called a pie chart. Um, we use circle graphs to answer the questions below. That's what we're going to do. What percent of the chlorine sources are natural? Well, when you start having graphs, you got to have either symbols or colors to differentiate between data or comparisons. This one, we use colors um, in, pie, in pie charts. We see here. The yellow are natural sources. The red are manufactured compounds. So, <clears throat> excuse me. There are two shades of yellow. Both are natural. So if we look at the percent of chlorine that are natural, we have methyl chloride, which is 15%, hydrogen chloride, which is 3%. So because they are all or both natural, a total of 18% of the chlorine in the stratosphere is natural. And that leaves us with the remaining pi in this case of 82% are manufactured. So you ask yourself, which source supplies the most chlorine to the stratosphere? Well, again, you don't even have to calculate really anything here. You can visually look at what color represents which type, and just by looking at that, you see that the manufactured um, compounds make up over 75%, which is a pretty significant figure of the chlorine in the stratosphere. <clears throat> um. Also, as my as I was letting some people finish, my mind started going off until next week. Uh, just a kind of reminder that uh, in case you don't have the stuff for your test, I am going to allow notes. Um, obviously, a calculator, but also uh, that uh, metric unit value sheet that I gave you. You had the black lines on the side. And you have it to you at the very beginning of the chapter. If you don't have it, you've lost it, whatever, I do believe I put a copy out there on Classroom towards the beginning of the chapter. So you can find it there. Highly recommend you look through your stuff, make sure you have it, okay? Because for the test, it's got to be done in class. Trying to give you 
as many opportunities to be successful on that coming test. Okay. <clears throat> Bar graphs. These are defined as a graph that shows quantity varying across different categories. So it gives us a broad range of information. We can have time, location, temperature. And those are all broad, those are just some broad categories, okay? <clears throat> when we have a bar graph, and this also goes for a line graph that we're going to see in a little bit. You have two axes. You have the y-axis, which is the vertical. This is displaying the quantity being measured. And this is the dependent variable. There's those terms again. Dependent, independent variable. Okay. Again, those measurements on the y-axis depend on the independent variable. Okay, they are the result. The x-axis, which is the horizontal, it displays the independent variable. Now, I've got a, a little saying, and I may have said it in here before, but I'm going to say it again. Okay. When you have a graph, whether it be a bar graph or a line graph that we're going to see next, they both are set up in a very similar fashion in terms of dependent and independent variable. So I've got this saying here, okay? This is my our little graph here. Dry over here, mix down there. Have I showed you this before? Okay. Anyway, what these little acronyms mean, okay, is for dry, it's the Dependent, dependent, that's an A. Yeah, I can't spell it today. Woo. Dependent variable or the result, okay, on the Y axis. Okay. Mix. Stands for manipulated, meaning changed, or independent, I'm going to spell it right this time, variable on the x axis. Dry mix, okay? Hopefully that'll help you keep them um, differentiated enough. And these types of graphs, these bar graphs, are used typically for comparisons. So to utilize this particular type of graph, we have a question that says, during which four months does Jacksonville receive about half of its annual precipitation? Okay? Through about half. What would you say? It goes from January all the way through December. Did I say June? January through September? Just wait, yeah, I did say. Oh, sorry, you're saying the answer. Yeah. Okay, June through September. So June all the way through here. So you think that's where it says um, it receives about half of its annual precipitation? That'd be half or that'd be double? The, the January, February, March, and May. Yeah. There, yeah, that's probably what I would go with as well. Now, I'll be honest. After you read that, you still probably had a few questions. Not one hundred percent certain what your answer could be, right? And yet, <clears throat> that's kind of where. Maybe a little bit of more information could have been helpful. Because does anywhere on here actually tell us what the annual precipitation is for Jacksonville? Nowhere on there. Okay? All it does is say precipitation of Jacksonville from 1961 to 1990, 
and there, and there. Okay. By providing just a little bit of extra information, like what is the annual precipitation for Jacksonville, we could then, with greater confidence, give a better or a, a solid answer. That's why when you present data, it is always best to kind of lean on the side of um, more information to help explain. Okay, I've I've looked at. I mean, throughout my career as a student and as a teacher, I've looked at numerous um, articles, studies, and everything like that. That um, you know, you look at the data, you're like, I have no idea what they're even trying to show me. And even when I read through the the uh, paper or the article, sometimes it's still a little difficult at that point too. So it leaves it leaves the reader. Um, with a lot of questions, with a lot of questions can sometimes lead to doubt in terms of the data being presented. Okay, so our goal is to really eliminate doubt. Next, we have line graphs defined as a graph that has points on a line that represent the intersection for two variables. And it is organized in a very similar fashion to a bar graph. You have the y axis. Again, showing the dependent variable. And this is, again, this is the variable that deliberately changes during an experiment. It's your result of what you're actually testing. Your x-axis, which, again, is your horizontal. This, again, displays your independent variable. And this is basically the variable determined during an experiment, Okay, what you are testing. Again, this, when conducting experiments, is the one that you typically use in science. Because in science, when we conduct experiments, we like to test how, you know, test one thing um, and then disturb it to some fashion. Or we want to see which, you know, if we're trying to grow plants, which amount of light is going to produce the best growth in the plant. So you are testing objects and looking at the result. Okay. When you have a line graph, you have what's called a best fit line. And this line must be drawn so that as many points fall above the line as they do below it. So you're trying to show that with all your data points that you are capable of drawing a linear line that will have the majority, if not you know, all in a perfect world, of your data points falling on that line. It's kind of like the whole um, bullseye that we talked about. The more... Um, the, the more data points you have on or very close to the line, the more accurate you're going to be. Okay. Um, the more you have just scattered everywhere, less accurate your data is. Okay. <clears throat> of course, this occurs because those points are scattered. Sometimes you might refer to this as a scatter plot. But line graphs are the typical name. So interpreting line graphs, we have what's called a linear relationship. And this occurs when a best fit line is completely straight. Not ziggy zaggy or anything like that. And this best this best fit line directly relates the variables of the graph. Now, in regards to the line itself, we're getting into a little bit of math terminology here. We've got positive slope and negative slope. A positive slope occurs if the line rises to the right. And this indicates that the dependent variable increases as the independent variable increases.
If you have negative slope, this occurs if the line sinks to the right. And this indicates that the dependent variable decreases as the independent variable increases. Typically, a positive slope indicates a, um, a kind of a normal uh, relationship. And a negative slope indicates an inverse relationship, where one goes up, the other goes down. Now, in order to calculate the slope, we have to use data points. Okay. We have to, in fact, we have to use two data points. And you want to take data points that are somewhat um, far away. Okay. They can be the first and last data point or kind of anywhere in between. But you want to make sure there's a good distance between them. And you use the slope formula of y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So if we had a graph that was like this, okay, here's my two points. This is at um, x of 2 and y of 1. And this one is x of 6 and oops, x of 6 and y of 5. In order to calculate this slope, we're going to call this x2, y2. We're going to call this x1, y1. So, again, you're going to have y2, which is 5, minus y1, which is 1, over x2, which is 6, minus x1, which is 2. And so that would give you your overall slope of the line that would fit on those two data points. Okay? So, <clears throat> terms associated with graph interpretation. Here are some tips that kind of are going to help you interpret data. Okay? First, you want to identify the independent and dependent variables on the graph. You then want to look at the ranges of data. How, you know, in, in what ranges were the data collected. That's determine what measurements were taken, and then determine if the graph is either linear or nonlinear. And if you determine it is linear, oftentimes it's good to uh, interpret the slope. And then once you've done all that, you're going to use inter uh, interpolation or extrapolation. I love the term extrapolation, personally. But interpolation is defined as the reading and estimating values falling between points on the graph. So, met, so basically, interpolation is, you know, after we find the slope of the graph, you know, we can estimate about the points in between those two points that we use to calculate the slope. So they are inside in turn our data points extrapolation is going to take estimating values outside of the points by extending the line so based upon my slope i can i can estimate if we were to continue this off to the right that my slope would continue that way with an estimation of what my points could be all based upon my slope. A lot of times you might hear people say, extrapolate that data or extrapolate that meaning. That just means like take the meaning and apply it to something. Okay? Take it from one place, use it in another. And the last slide of chapter two. So we're going to take those guidelines, those hints, and we're going to interpret this data. Okay, we've got four questions here. Identify the independent and dependent variables. Okay, I'm going to ask you, what is the independent variable in this case? You should be able to see it on yours as well. 
What is the independent variable? The months? Is that what you said? Yeah. Yes. The months. Okay. Because independent variables go on the x-axis. Okay. Well, what about the dependent variables? Where are they located? Or what would the dependent variable be in this case? Total ozone. And those units, it says DU. That stands for Dobson units. Those are units specifically um, used for measuring ozone. All right. So what are the ranges of data? Now, this question might be a little like, I don't know. What your ranges of data would be for this case would be the amount of ozone from August through April in the years of 1957 to 1972. And that same time frame of months from 1999 to 2000. Well, it's interesting when you look at this data, that red line, 1957 to 1972. This green line is 99 to 2000. 15 years of data collection, one year of data collection. As you can see here, the total amount of ozone has dropped significantly in just a single time frame compared to 15 years. So you can start thinking about, you know, okay, what's happened between 72 and 99? A lot, um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that go in there, but a lot of times what we look at what's called CFCs, chlorofluorocarbons. Used to be a lot of aerosols, spray paints, hairsprays. They hold the button down and go like crazy. Well, they found that those were a big boo-boo to the, uh, the atmosphere. So they now have um, different, what they call propellants for um, stuff like that. And you even see that a lot of times when they are a type of uh, product that you hold the button and it continually sprays, that it will say on there, no CFCs, because essentially they were banned because they were finding a significant impact on the ozone. What measurements were taken? Well, measurements that were taken were Dobson units, total ozone during the months. The last question I'm gonna have you think about is, would you consider this to be a linear or non-linear graph? Think about it. Again, let's go back a little bit. Linear says there's a direct relationship. First, when we have a best fit line, you know, that straight line. Do you think if we had a straight line that all those data points would line up really close to it? No. So I would say that this is a non-linear line, or this graph is non-linear. It's all ziggy-zaggy. There are any slides that you need me to go back to so you can fill in? Because you want to make sure that you have all of these filled in for next week. Okay? Again, if you are at home and you realize you're missing some, well, you know that Classroom and YouTube, or YouTube channel, they've got all the previous recordings, okay? So for the next, what is it, uh, eight minutes or so, you can, you can pack up, stay at your desks, but you may chat among your neighbors while I get this.